The cubicle represents a tyranny that it confines your imagination, your thoughts into a small physical area. Imagine pretty much every software engineer or finance person being able to you know, disconnect from their desk and look at holographic monitors on a beach and doing their work from there. That's not going to be science fiction. It's the modern office place. Silicon Valley is all about building the future. A startup called Meta thinks it's getting there first, thanks to a big bet that it's made on augmented reality. How are you? Good, thank you. Welcome to Meta. Thank you. Call it a 360 degree office where you can spatialize your thoughts as part of your workflow for education, architecture, design, engineering, etc. People often mix up augmented reality with virtual reality. VR totally blocks your ability to see or hear the real world. AR overlays holograms onto what you already see. Meta has tried to make its version of the workspace feel familiar. You grab the hologram instead of using a controller or a mouse, and your brain already knows how to do it. In other words, we've designed an operating system that humanity has always known how to use. So you can see this eyeball, which is, by the way, photorealistic. You can see my hand is occluding the eyeball, and now the eyeball is occluding my hand, right? You see those two circles? They get small, and then they turn into this glowing white ball, and then I can move my hand around supernaturally. I can do this with two hands and rotate the thing. I can stretch it. I can throw it back right into the shelving system, and that's all you have to learn to become a modern worker. And to prove this, the employees at Meta have started to get rid of their computer monitors, trading them in for Meta's augmented reality headsets. Miron thinks that in less than a decade, we'll all be just wearing strips of glass that can project holograms. In the early 80s, everybody had computers on their desktop, but no one was using them because they had a lot of work to do. So they were still using typewriters. And at some point, the CEO took all the typewriters away and everybody was forced to use their computers. So it's very exciting to see a new generation of technology, a new paradigm. I consider us like pioneers in the holographic wild. I'm pulling up my browser with my hands and I'm sending out emails to colleagues and just kind of really acclimating to the new environment. Now you're putting on my computer, essentially. Our digital lives live on our phones. We have all of our pictures and notes and all these kinds of things. So why don't you write yourself a little sticky note? I like it. And go ahead and just take your fist right over the top of the sticky note and close your fist. And now. Oh, what? Meta's own transition to augmented reality has run into plenty of unexpected problems. And it's still going to be a while before you'll start to see these devices in your office. But I think it's a future worth waiting for. If we could see these holograms between us, we will have been able to share our work with one another more naturally, more efficiently, and more productively than ever before. Humanity will have evolved slightly.
CTE is often found in the brains of deceased athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Hundreds have donated their brains to the VA Boston University Concussion Legacy Foundation Brain Bank. This is a former NFL player who died in his early 70s. And this is a, a veteran uh, who also died in his early 70s. Dr. Ann McKee dissects these brains. The hippocampus and the mammillary bodies are very important for memory. I can see that they're slightly affected. McKee recently dissected the brain of former New England Patriots player Aaron Hernandez, who was convicted of murder and later committed suicide. And you'll see right away that the brain is showing signs of shrinkage. You can see the crevices in the brain that you can't see in the normal. McKee says Hernandez's severe case of CTE impacted his decision making, depression, and ability to control rage and aggression. Right now, she thinks we're underestimating how many people have CTE. We were able to distinguish between CTE and controls and CTE and Alzheimer's disease. The next question is, can we do this in the blood and can we do this in living people? And we aren't there yet with those answers. But the need for a diagnosis in the living is motivating companies such as Quanterix in Lexington, Massachusetts, to work faster on technology that could diagnose concussions and CTE in as few as 30 minutes. Kevin Rosovsky is the CEO. It's like a high-powered microscope. And so by doing that, we can see little biomarkers that you couldn't see before in the blood. Quanterix received a grant from the NFL and just went public. Since then, its stock is up more than 40 percent. The company sells a machine called Samoa for $175,000 to other biotechs, hospitals, and researchers. And for the first time in history, we're able to see brain health in blood, and that's a major breakthrough, and that's leading to less invasive testing, and we've already been able to see evidence of concussions, and there's the beginning evidence of being able to see the accumulated effect of concussions. Quanterix is also trying to detect Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. Rosovsky says he thinks diagnosing concussions will be easier than diagnosing CTE. Diagnosing CT in the living probably is a couple years away. We're real excited to see the progress but reducing some of that work into actual tests in a laboratory takes time. There's regulatory approvals. There's a lot of um, red tape that you have to go through. Also in this race to diagnose CTE in the blood are Athlon Medical and Exosome Sciences. And New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is scanning for the disease in the living. But it's just one step in a series of questions for those with serious head trauma. There's still no cure for CTE. Even if we had a great idea for a treatment, there's no way to test if, whether it's effective or not. So that's the enormous advance that we'll get if we can develop a biomarker for this disease. In Boston and Mostu, Bloomberg News.
You don't write about cars for a living without meeting some pretty interesting characters. So I'm circling back and getting cozy with some of my favorite automotive aficionados. We'll talk shop, luxury, and passion in a new series I call Crossing Lanes. Well, good to see you again. What's it been a couple Thanks. of years, right? I think a couple yeah. of years, yeah. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, it was a few new things. I brought something, I think, which could not be more Americana. This is a 1958 Imperial. Just the epitome of American optimism that post-war, we won World War II, now we started a space program. All cars had fins and the Jetsons was coming on TV. How many feet is this car? I don't know. People lose count after yeah. a certain after number. After 20 feet. feet. Yeah. They're sort of like dinosaurs from another era. This would sort of be the demographic car that I, I think the average TV viewer would remember. I mean, look how much room there is in this car. It's just hilarious. I love how huge the gauges are, They're like giant yeah. high plate. This was considered safety. This Padded with leather. Yeah, no great hurry to uh -huh. be safe. And the way you start is you turn the key and then you hit the neutral button. Everything is push button. Yeah, people think that's a new car thing, but actually, no. old car. If you can type, you can drive. Just <laughs> press the button and you pull away. How many cars can you cross your legs in the front seat? I mean, none, except for this. Tall too. Good. Comfortable car, isn't it? You don't get all wind blown. You can have a conversation, yeah. even though we're so far apart. You wonder how many 16-year-olds took their driver's tests in these big stupid I things. I mean, what about the parallel parking section? Uh, don't that even think would be about an issue. parallel parking. Huh? <laughs> so, what cars did you grow up idolizing when you were a young kid? You know, when you grew up in a little town in New England, anything with less than four doors might as well have been a Ferrari. <laughs> Nobody had cool cars. I was nine, ten years old. I was riding my bicycle up a hill, and I saw an old man polishing a 1951 Jaguar XK120, and I was fixated. He said, come on over, you want to sit in it? It was unbelievable. I had never seen anything like that. You have to remember, back in 59, 60, most Car magazines were black and white. You didn't really get the sense mm. of speed or excitement or anything from it. Who taught you how to drive? So many houses had abandoned cars mm -hmm. and fields. And there was a 2CV in a field near my friend's house. And when we were kids, we'd go over there and work on it. And we got it running. And we would just drive it around the fields all day. And our moms, you know, would sit at the kitchen window and watch us. Oh, OK, I did all right. Once you finally started making some real money, mm. what did you finally buy as a special car purchase? Well, the first car I bought when I came to California was my 55 Buick Roadmaster, which I still have. I got off the plane. I had no place to live. And in California, you need a car before you need a place to live. So I bought the 55 Buick for $350. And I lived in that. I slept in it. I met my wife in it. I got married in that car. Wow. Drove the car to my first Tonight Show. And I still have it. That was a special car. How would you define a luxury car? Nobody does luxury like the French. The French put a premium on comfort while driving. The cars don't appear to be ostentatious or flashy, but they're exceptionally nice to drive and very, very comfortable. We Americans tend to confuse luxury with crashed, garish. I mean, mm -hmm. look at Trump's apartment. Is sitting on a gold chair really comfortable? <laughs> luxury at all. It's like Oscar Wilde, you know, the price of everything, the value of nothing. Well, have you ever paid more than you thought you should for something that you no, bought? No, all I've done is buy too early. Now, mm -hmm. I see a lot of people, they buy something because they immediately think they're going to make a lot of money on it. Mm -hmm. Then when they find out it's not worth as much as they thought, now they hate the car. The most important thing is buy what you like. Yeah. And then worry about the price later. And I don't mean that from like, oh, I'm so rich. Right? No. Better off you pay a little bit more and buy something you truly enjoy. Yeah. You know? If you were 21, 22, 23 now, would you still get into the business? I always like telling stories and doing yeah. comedy. I mean, I always like talking to people. Uh -huh. So, yeah, That's I think nice that fit. I would. You know, my dad sold insurance, uh -huh. and he became manager. And once a month, to motivate the men, he would put on some kind of goofy show, or he'd play, yeah. like, the Sinatra song, High Hopes, and he'd juggle. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll sell insurance because you get to do a show once a month. That is very interesting. Yeah. I love that. 
Well, Jay, it's been so great talking with you. Yeah, it's always fun when you come by. We have fun. We have a good time. Yeah. And let's continue motoring. Motoring. That's the proper term. <laughs> Mumbai can overwhelm you. For Indians, it's both New York and LA, Hollywood and Wall Street. It offers the sensory overload of the world's second largest country and intricate traditions crafted over millennia. It's a lot to take in if you only have a few days on this colorful but chaotic peninsula. I'm Nikki Eckstein, travel editor for Bloomberg Pursuits, and I'll show you how to make the most of Mumbai. India is outpacing a slew of Western destinations to become the world's sixth largest business travel market. And the Oberoi, a sleek oasis in the middle of all the action, is perfect for business travelers. Good afternoon. Welcome to Oberoi, Mumbai. Nice to meet you. Thank you. The staff is extremely thoughtful and detail-oriented. Hi. Ma'am, uh, welcome to the Oberoi. It's very refreshing in a weather like this, wouldn't you have a set? Nowhere else have I been greeted with personally embroidered napkins and customized suites. Plus, the rooms are spacious, with comfortable beds and large work desks. Across the peninsula, you'll find the Gateway of India, Mumbai's most iconic monument. Though the city name was officially changed in 1995, most locals still call it Bombay. And just behind the Gateway is the Taj Mahal Palace, the city's most impressive hotel. If the Oberoi is all brains, the Taj is all beauty. As you wander the halls, you can feel the weight of Indian history, from the colonial styling to the modern-day masterpieces lining the hall. 
all the traffic and bustling markets in Mumbai can be dizzying. So yoga near the stunning pool offers a welcome respite. You experience the luxury of this morning, so you can experience the complete vitality throughout the day. When it comes to business dinners, head straight to the table around the corner from the Taj. It's classy without being pretentious and quiet enough for deal making. That may be why the locals are obsessed with this spot. The menu is more trendy than traditional, with knockouts like sweet and sour Brussels sprouts and yellow fin tuna tataki. Plan to eat dinner late. 9 p.m. is standard. If you have a day off, escape the clamor of the city by hopping a ferry to Elefanta Island. Eventually, the city fades, and a sort of inner calm sets in. You'll be surrounded by sweet Indian children who toss snacks to flocks of seagulls that trail the boat. You can also hire a speedboat for about $500 to cut the journey from an hour to 25 minutes, but you'll miss the local color. On the island, you'll find a path with about a thousand stairs and a handful of feisty monkeys. It leads to a series of amazing 5th century caves, lined with relief sculptures dedicated to the Hindu god of Shiva. If you can't make it across the water, you can stay right in the middle of Mumbai where there's plenty to see. Stop by a streetside coconut vendor, they're everywhere, and if you're still jet lagged, the electrolytes will help. One of my favorite hole in the walls in all of Mumbai is Sri Thakur Bojanale. There's just one choice here, bright and flavorful Gujarati thalis, which are like all you can eat sampler platters. The restaurant was passed down from father to son, and the son is very enthusiastic about his locally sourced cuisine. Since India has gone cashless, ask to add a 10% tip before settling the bill. You can also charge tips for bellhops and housekeeping back at the hotel. After lunch, hit the streets and find the perfect piece of India to take back home. D. Popley and Sons is a family affair where the owner keeps the real jewels hidden in the back room. The owner's son designs many of the pieces himself and sources the rest from Jaipur. Antiques are huge in India, but you can't take anything that's more than 100 years old out of the country. You can, however, pick up carved elephants and crystal drawer pulls salvaged from Maharaja palaces at Esages, just next door. Nearby at Phillips, I also found beautiful folk art figurines and an amazing vintage photo collection. For clothing, there's a great spot called Bungalow 8, hidden under the bleachers of Mumbai's biggest cricket stadium. It's tricky to find, but you'll be rewarded with the prettiest caftans and block printed scarves, all arranged by color. But back to business. If you have one last deal to close, head to Bombay Canteen. The menu is an ode to India's regional recipes and native ingredients, like red snapper ceviche in a kokum broth or Kashmiri lamb. And don't miss a drink at Air, the rooftop bar at the Four Seasons. Guest bartenders shake up some of the city's best sundowners. Go to make one last impression with colleagues, or let Bombay make one last impression on you.
With SUVs growing in popularity, it only made sense to get some on this show. So in this review, we're going to compare three of the best rated luxury SUVs on the market. This isn't going to be easy. We've got our hands on an Audi Q5, a Porsche Cayenne GTS, and a BMW X5. I've decided to spend a day in the Hamptons with each of them to get an in-depth look. Now this is the Q5, it's Audi's mid-size SUV, and it starts at about $41,000, which is way more affordable than the other two cars that we're looking at. This is kind of like the iPhone of luxury SUVs. It's designed so well, but it's also affordable within the segment. This is a four-cylinder, all-wheel drive, seven-speed automatic with paddle shifters, 252 horsepower, and there's no lag. Immediate power, immediate response. The minute you step on the gas, you're there. has by far the most futuristic interior of the three cars. It's minimal, it's clean. The sunroof spans the entire width of the ceiling. It's really cool. There's plenty of room for five adults, lots of headroom, but this is the smallest car of the ones that we're testing. The trunk is 29 cubic feet, which is in the middle of our range. A family on a trip might have trouble fitting everything in. There are other cars that are more powerful, that look more distinct, but it's also really affordable, and Audi has really kind of hit a sweet spot. So how did it add up? The immediate response really made me feel in control. The horsepower was a little weaker at 252, and the 22 mile per gallon means that this is in the middle of the road. Looks-wise, it was a bit conservative. It's the smallest of our three, but with a sleek interior. And the pricing is the best at $41,000. Now this is the BMW X5 Hybrid. That means it gets 56 miles per gallon combined between the electric motor and the conventional engine. This car starts at 62,000, so it's right in the middle of our group. The electric motor and the engine switch off depending on what drive mode, how fast you're going, all of that. What you won't find out from the stats on the website is how big this car feels when you sit in it and how small it drives. It's a nice balance. So the interior, it's not as futuristic, it's not as clean and modern feeling, but it's also a little less full of buttons and levers and gauges. This does feel like it's the roomiest of the three. I think a lot of it has to do with the natural light. The most visibility for sure. And with the seats in use, the trunk still comes up with nearly 36 cubic feet, which is massive. To recap, the handling was exceptional. 308 horsepower is middle of our range and an amazing 56 miles per gallon with the combined electric motor. It was sporty without being over aggressive. The roomiest, but with a toned down interior. And at $62,000, it's mid-range for our selection. Now the third car in our group is a Porsche Cayenne GTS. This is a higher tuned version of Porsche's Cayenne and it starts fittingly at $97,000. That's by far the most expensive of any car of our group and it's also the most powerful. Porsche was among the first of the luxury car makers to introduce an SUV. It really sets the standard for a lot of things. The engine here is a 3.6 liter V6 twin turbocharged engine. 440 horsepower, almost double the horsepower of the Audi. 443 foot-pounds of torque, and you definitely feel it when you push the gas pedal. The thing that you notice are the buttons and levers and knobs and vents. So if you're someone who likes this cockpit stuff to play with, you're gonna love this car. This trunk was actually the smallest at 24 cubic feet, but after you put the seats down, you'll get by. It drives fast, it feels really luxurious inside. It's really striking to look at. It just costs a lot of money. Okay, this car was the most powerful. 440 horsepower, 434 foot-pounds of torque. Unfortunately, only 19 miles per gallon combined. This is a true sports car in SUV form. It had decent space and the interior was loaded with gadgets. But the downside, I'd say, is price. $97,000 means this car will dig deep into your wallet. 
The luxury SUV segment is a competitive field. There are a lot of really confident players, and these three are all excellent vehicles. However, after three days of driving, I felt the BMW checked the most boxes in terms of performance, agility, style, and value. Was it the fastest or the most powerful? No but it was the most versatile while moderately priced for a luxury SUV. With the largest interior, the most visibility, and the fact that it's a hybrid with a 56 miles per gallon rating, that just pushes it over the edge. This car has a great value and anyone would be happy to have it. The perfect sports car should combine sexy good looks with nimble steering, aggressive power, and a high quality cabin. It'll be expensive, but not so pricey that it's out of reach for everyone. Porsche, Mercedes, and Jaguar have three of the top sports cars on offer today, but which is the best for you? Let's get the numbers out of the way. All three cars have impressive stats. The Porsches come just slightly behind the Benz and the Jag, but each is a thrill to drive in its own way. This is the 2017 Porsche 911 Carrera Cabriolet. The engine in this is a 420 horsepower, six cylinder boxer engine mounted in the rear. This is Porsche's famous engine. It's difficult to describe the feeling when you get behind the wheel. This is where that mystical Porsche X factor comes in. The rear wheel drive on 20 inch Carrera S wheels and Porsche torque vectoring grip the road better than any other model in our group. The AMG GTS is faster and more fun to drive than any other Mercedes. I think it feels like a rocket ship. This car has a lot to offer. It has that amazing V8 engine, it has the horsepower, it has the torque. Of course, if you're not careful, the rear wheel drive AMG will fishtail forward with a mind of its own. That said, it's amazing in a straight line. 
This is the two-door coupe Jaguar debuted in 2015 as a way to get back in the game. And the company did it with flying colors. The handling is great. I mean, this car is so perfectly balanced. It's really a treat to drive, especially on windy roads. The torque that you feel when you drive it is the most impressive of the group. But it's not as connected to the road as the 911, nor as smooth as the AMG. It is tight when it comes to steering and braking. The 911 is eminently recognizable, yet after all these years, it still impresses. The front end is flirtatious, the rear is muscly, and the headlights are friendly. This is Mercedes bad boy halo car meant to recall the glorious Gullwing SL that Mercedes made in the 1960s. The idea is that its sexy allure will attract young new fans to the brand. This is the car you want to get to make a really loud statement. The Jag is all muscles and roar, punched up at the seams like a football player. If you kind of like a hunky mass of metal and gears under your foot, this one is the car for you. Porsche was the first sporting brand to introduce the PDK paddle shift technology, which is quicker and better for city driving than the manual. There is also a back seat in this option, something the other two don't have. Now, I don't know if you put anybody in that back seat except for maybe your dog or someone you don't like, but it is back there and you can use it in a pinch. Inside, I loved how the Mercedes looks. It has crazy octopus-like round dials all the way through the center and the dash, and everything felt thick and rich. There is plenty to see inside the Jaguar. Lots of loud blue stitching, performance seats, and even a handle for the front passenger to hold onto for dear life. This is the least well done of our three when it comes to interior quality and design, but it's still pretty great. The bottom line, you can't go wrong with any of these incredible machines. But if you want the whole package at the best value, the 911 is the clear winner. Sure, it's not as aggressive looking as the AMG, and it has less power than the Jag, but its incredible connection to the ground, its cozy perfect German handling, its superior suspension, and its minimal but quality interior mean the 911 Carrera S Cabriolet more than stands its ground.
When you hear the word Ferrari, you probably think fast, sleek, or maybe risque. What you don't think is practical. And Ferrari is not the first car you think to take to pick up your Christmas tree. But that's exactly what I did. I drove a Ferrari GTC for Luso two hours outside of New York City to Barclays, a fourth generation orchard and tree farm. I wanted to test out Ferrari practicality. Welcome to Barclays Tree Farm. I'm Steve Barclay. I'm Hannah Elliott. Nice, nice to, meet to meet you. you. Should you go find your perfect tree? Let's do it. Excellent. What kind of trees are these? Oh, uh, we've got Douglas fir and uh, Norway spruce in here. This looks great. So this is the one, yeah, huh? I like it. It's good. Okay, let's do it. There's not exactly enough room in the back for a tree, but the Luso has all you need for this errand. It's a four-seat hatchback that Ferrari debuted last year. Plus, the Luso has something really helpful, practical even. It's higher off the ground than a standard Rari. Getting in and out wasn't the usual awkward struggle I often have with low sports cars. I would even call this shockingly drivable. This is the perfect Ferrari for people who love to drive. And I know that sounds crazy because it's the hatchback Ferrari, but the thing about the car is it has a V12 680 horsepower engine on all wheel drive. That means it has the beating heart of a Ferrari track car that will compete with anything from Lamborghini and McLaren built into this package that is totally functional. And an elaborate traction and stability system in the rear that Ferrari calls thrust vectoring. Basically, it smooths out the car's response to unstable conditions like snow, ice, or bumpy roads. I mean, I had this buying holiday decorations at Target. We had the tree on the top. Uh, I had this in snow and slush and ice, and it performs so well. Inside, the front feels like a very luxurious cockpit, which makes sense after all, the word luso means luxury in Italian. The back is spacious enough for a couple of adults, and it roars from 0 to 62 in 3.4 seconds. Top speed is 208. So what gives? Why did Ferrari make a practical car? Well, to hold on to its most loyal fans. Now there are rumors that Ferrari will unveil an SUV in 2018, but until then, it hopes to keep Ferrari customers in the family with the Lusso. So hang on, Ferrari fans. Next year, maybe Santa will leave a prancing pony SUV in the driveway. Until then, the Lusa will do.
Wow, this is a Callaway Corvette Aero Wagon. It is the most powerful car made in the US, period. It's supercharged with the supercharger pushing up all the way through the hood. 757 horsepower, this car will go from zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds, which is nuts. So let's put it to the test. I'm going to head out to Rockaway for lunch and we'll see what this beauty can do. So Callaway, the very same name that engineers golf clubs, modifies these Corvettes. And in this aero wagon, the main upgrade is the supercharged engine, and it's so fast. The fuel efficiency is 27 miles per gallon at speed on the highway. That's like prime optimum conditions but it's still pretty incredible considering most cars with 757 horsepower get like 12 to 13 miles per gallon. So the aero wagon part of the Callaway Corvette is totally new this year. It's a huge departure from what a typical Corvette looks like and that's by design. The trunk is enormous and that's what you're really getting by choosing to have this option. The interior is just like the regular Corvette that you'd buy directly from GM, it's very much like a cockpit. So the Belt Parkway isn't exactly the Autobahn, but I was able to get a feel for the strength of the supercharger and I made it down to Rockaway Beach in no time flat. Hannah. The starting price is about $130,000. The money goes toward the engineering that makes this car so powerful and fast. But still, that is so much cheaper than what you might find at Ferrari or McLaren or Lamborghini. This can keep up with all of those cars, and it's far less expensive.
Sometimes I don't trust love at first sight, not even when a car looks this good. So I decided to put the Tesla Model X through its paces for five days in the mountains along the California coast. I needed to know, was this just a crush or a lasting love affair? I first drove the $151,000 SUV briefly in Los Angeles last year, and at the time thought it was one of the best cars I'd ever tested. But a 340 mile road trip can make or break any relationship. One push of the button and the Model X will automatically route your trip according to where the superchargers line up. It probably won't be the fastest route, but you know you won't run out of juice. We were on our way. It was the start of something beautiful. The seats are situated high inside, but they're easy to access, even the back row. And the interior cabin is so quiet I could hear crickets chirping outside as I drove, with the windows up. The car has almost no body roll around corners, and it handles beautifully on the sandy beach. I will say that the battery gauge can be deceiving. It doesn't decrease at a stable rate, so you can jump down in range a lot quicker than you expect. We left this morning with a full charge, and we've been driving for four hours or so, um, so we're down to about 77 miles on the battery. So I asked the car to find us the closest supercharger, and we're driving there now, and we should get there in about 12 minutes. Turns out I had some major time to kill. Hey, Grandma. Oh, nothing much. How are you? Back on the road, I could focus on the feel of the all-wheel drive, test the 3.2 second 0 to 60 mile per hour sprint time, and the 762 equivalent horsepower. It feels really fast when you push down the gas pedal. The brakes are regenerative, so you have to get used to their different feel. I never really did. And the automatic front doors can be tricky. They open when you least expect it. At the end of this trip, I realized the real question here is not, should you buy this car, but do you want to join the electric lifestyle? You really do feel virtuous when you drive it. No fossil fuels here. But owning an electric car saps your time and energy if you're not deliberate about charging. It makes it harder to be spontaneous and free. And you have to be okay with giving up the raw, pure feeling of driving a mechanical car. But if you are that kind of driver, the kind that wants to be on the cutting edge of luxury and technology, you're going to fall in love.
The season is upon us, and everyone, including me, is thinking about what to pour for all those holiday gatherings. Hi, I'm Aileen McCoy, here to talk about the holidays and why. I picked three under $30. Yes, $30. The first wine is a white. It's the 2016 Abatzia di Novicella Kerner, and it costs only $20. Kerner is an exotic white varietal, but what you really need to know is that it translates into deliciousness. This wine is also from an unusual varietal, and unusual obscure varietals are really in right now. It has a fantastic aroma. It has lovely zingy fruit flavors, which are very bright and crisp so that you feel the wine is bigger, richer, and will go with something that is really quite serious in terms of food. Now we're ready for the red. It's the 2014 Chateau Cartier from Saint-Emilion in Bordeaux, and it costs $27. Classic Bordeaux's do not all cost $100 and up and have to be aged for decades. This is made from 100% Merlot. It's ready to drink right now. Let's taste. It has lovely plum and cassis aromas, just the way a Bordeaux is supposed to, and charming fruit that's really delicious, along with silky tannins. Because it's so fruity and easy to drink, it will go with everything from roast turkey with dressing to a juicy prime rib, and it's perfect for white wine snobs to sip at a cocktail party. Now for the best, the sparkling wine. This is the Schlomsberg Mirabel Brut from California and it's only $25. It's a blend of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and it was aged in 19th century caves on Diamond Mountain. Now let's pop the cork. Bubbles are essential for the holidays and look festive in a glass. The smell of this wine is like just baked brioche, and the flavors are lemony tart and so refreshing. Keep a few bottles in the fridge for when friends stop by or when you need to perk yourself up while you're cooking. Cheers.
When you hear the word Ferrari, you probably think fast, sleek, or maybe risque. What you don't think is practical. And Ferrari is not the first car you think to take to pick up your Christmas tree. But that's exactly what I did. I drove a Ferrari GTC for Luso two hours outside of New York City to Barclays, a fourth generation orchard and tree farm. I wanted to test out Ferrari practicality. Hey. Welcome to Barclays Tree Farm. I'm Steve Barclay. I'm Hannah Elliott. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. You should go find your perfect tree. Let's do it. Excellent. What kind of trees are these? Oh, we've got Douglas fir and uh, Norway spruce in here. This looks great. So this is the one, yeah, huh? I like it. It's good. Okay, let's do it. There's not exactly enough room in the back for a tree, but the Luso has all you need for this errand. It's a four-seat hatchback that Ferrari debuted last year. Plus, the Luso has something really helpful, practical even. It's higher off the ground than a standard Rari. Getting in and out wasn't the usual awkward struggle I often have with low sports cars. I would even call this shockingly drivable. This is the perfect Ferrari for people who love to drive. And I know that sounds crazy because it's the hatchback Ferrari, but the thing about the car is it has a V12 680 horsepower engine on all wheel drive. That means it has the beating heart of a Ferrari track car that will compete with anything from Lamborghini and McLaren built into this package that is totally functional. And an elaborate traction and stability system in the rear that Ferrari calls thrust vectoring. Basically, it smooths out the car's response to unstable conditions like snow, ice, or bumpy roads. I mean, I had this buying holiday decorations at Target. We had the tree on the top. Uh, I had this in snow and slush and ice, and it performs so well. Inside, the front feels like a very luxurious cockpit, which makes sense after all, the word luso means luxury in Italian. The back is spacious enough for a couple of adults, and it roars from 0 to 62 in 3.4 seconds. Top speed is 208. So what gives? Why did Ferrari make a practical car? Well, to hold on to its most loyal fans. Now there are rumors that Ferrari will unveil an SUV in 2018, but until then, it hopes to keep Ferrari customers in the family with the Lusso. So hang on, Ferrari fans. Next year, maybe Santa will leave a prancing pony SUV in the driveway. Until then, the Lusa will do. The design of this soy sauce bottle goes back to 1945 in Japan. A teenager named Kenji Ekwon had witnessed the aftermath of the atomic bomb falling on his hometown Hiroshima and was mourning the loss of his sister and father. After seeing the devastation, Ekwon's path changed. He first enrolled as a Buddhist monk, following in the footsteps of his father, but instead he decided to become a creator of things and bring happiness to people. As a young designer, Ekwon got a contract to design a tabletop soy sauce bottle for food company Kikoman. Soy sauce is a must for Japanese meals, but it was originally sold in big bottles that were hard to hold. It took Ekwon three years and about 100 prototypes to complete the design in 1961. The result is a small glass bottle with a narrow neck, a shape reminiscent of traditional Japanese sake flasks. It allows you to see how much sauce is left. It's stable on surfaces and comfortable to hold. The inward angle of the tip of the spout is also perfect at preventing drips and controlling flow. The design of the little soy sauce bottle was just the start of Ekwon's great journey. He also went on to create other icons of Japanese design. In Japan, Ekwon has become almost as recognizable as his bottle and 50 years later still appeared in commercials for the soy sauce. Today, the bottle can be found on the tables of homes and restaurants in more than 100 countries. And in 2015, the bottle was even exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Simple but elegant, this is the design made to create a small moment of happiness. 
without you even knowing it.